Va, oui. <rire> Alright, are we ready? Grabe ang internet ngayon. So. Ay, oo, oh, opo. Oh, oh, ah, okay. Sige po, good luck sa atin po. Alright. Sir God John. Po, team. Okay, Ma'am thank, you. thank you, Ma'am Carrie. Hey po, God bless sa lahat. God bless everyone. Ah. Oo nga, the internet. Alright. Sir John, usually na-open nyo exactly four, yeah? Or do you have time na medyo earlier than that? Open ko na ngayon. Set the as again. Okay. So turn on our ano muna siguro, yeah, our videos. Kung makita niyo attendees, ay na yung mga nagjo-join. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sir John. Hi everyone, you're here at the ST eTalks, organized by the Department of Social Development Services, College of Human Ecology, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. So you, we will be starting in two minutes. So we're just waiting for some of the participants to log in and join us. So we hope that we'll have a productive webinar for this afternoon and hope to have a lovely chat with you all. Thank you. Okay, we see a lot of people coming in, logging in, and joining us for this afternoon's STE Talks. Our topic for today is volunteerism in times of pandemic. Okay, welcome again to the Department of the Social Development Services, College of Human Ecology, University of the Philippines, Los Banos, STE Talks webinar series. Today's topic, as we mentioned earlier, is volunteerism in times of pandemic. This webinar is also live through Zoom, particularly for those who registered and UPLB's YouTube live stream. Live stream. So the live stream link is http colon slash double slash streaming.uplb.edu.ph. I am Jennifer Marie S. Amparo, Associate Dean of the College of Human Ecology and organizer of the first STE Talks together with Prof. Mark Felizar as co-organizer and co-moderator of today's webinar. We will officially start off our webinar with a message by Prof. Clarice Pulumbari of the Department of Social Development Services, College of Human Ecology, UPLB, to officially welcome us all. Good afternoon to our distinguished panelists, guests, and participants. In behalf of the Department of Social Development Services, College of Human Ecology, we welcome you to the first Social Technology, or STE Talks. The mission of the SDS is to conduct instruction, research, and extension programs that are instrumental in the development and strengthening of organizations and social institutions to enable them to actively participate in organizing, mobilizing, and managing human and environmental resources towards economic productivity, social development, 
and ecological well-being. As part of our extension function, we are launching ST eTalks. A webinar series that aims to provide a platform to discuss socially relevant issues, social technologies, and best practices in social development. These first webinar series convenes selected development practitioners to share their experiences in mobilizing and sustaining volunteerism in extraordinary and uncertain times such as the global COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, these times also call for extraordinary action for as health and development workers and volunteers face risk while they ensure delivery of essential services. We believe that the best practices and challenges that our esteemed panelists will discuss today in relation to volunteerism will provide useful insights on how social solidarity can prevail amid the fear and uncertainties brought about by the pandemic. Thank you and we hope you will continue to learn with us in other upcoming webinars. So that's the message from our chair, Prof. Clarice Polumbari. So this afternoon, we have four speakers. And um, they will share with us their personal as well as their organization's experiences on volunteerism. Each speaker have 10 to 15 minutes for their talk. All questions will be entertained after all speakers' presentation, but it doesn't stop you to post your questions already. So you have a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, just click it and type in your, your question, but please do indicate to whom you would like to address your question. So with that, it is an honor to present our speakers. So our first speaker is Pepper, is a community developer for Make Sense Asia. Her role focuses on providing free online training and mentorship on topics such as community building, campaigns and event organization, creativity and social entrepreneurship. She leads all citizen engagement efforts and programs for ambassadors across the region. Our second speaker is Eris Altea Antonio, who is the national convener of the 2030 Youth Force Philippines, who is part of the international community of youth pushing for the attainment of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. A. Antonio is a media practitioner producing content for various media platforms and writes newscasts mostly about politics, business, and economy, believing in the power of media to connect people and encourage action. Ea had been a volunteer for a community organization radio in the Philippines for over four years. In 2016, she co-founded Pinoy Catalyst, an online platform designed to be a one-on-one, one-stop shop or one-stop hub for the development sector of the Philippines. Our third speaker is Cesar Angelo Aurige, the UPLB Serve the People Brigade Task Force Cure spokesperson. He's currently taking BA Communication Arts and Sciences and also part of the University Student Council. He's also part of the Alliance Committee of their Cure, which mainly consists of looking for partner organizations, hospitals, and other local government units to help and build partnership with. Our last speaker, but certainly not the least, is Ms. Joanna Ella May Eroba, who is the Youth Engagement Officer of UNDP. Joe holds a master's degree in public management under the public policy and administration track and a bachelor's degree in management from the University of the Philippines, a fellow ISCA. She's a national UN volunteer specialist and sits in the UN Team U group on youth. She coordinates Youth Collab, a youth-led social movement co-led by UNDP and City Foundation that aims to accelerate the sustainable development goals through youth leadership, innovation, and entrepreneurship. So are we all ready for our speakers for this afternoon? 
All right, so I think we're all ready. Everybody has logged in. And again, uh, some of us could join through the live streaming by UPLB at streaming.uplb.edu.ph. So you could send it through FB or your networks as well. So with that, I'd like to call on our first speaker, uh, Pepper Limpoco, the community developer of Make Sense Philippines. Thank you, Ms. Jennifer. Let me go ahead and share my screen. One second, and I hope you can all hear me well. All right, here we go. Mr. Jennifer, could you just confirm if my screen is all good? Okay, I'm gonna go and assume that it's all right. <laughs> all good. That's all good, fine. thanks so much. All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you once again for inviting us to be part of this webinar, this program. We're always happy to share our initiatives and to meet other NGOs and enterprises who are working in the same ecosystem. So without further ado, let me go ahead and reintroduce myself. Um, obviously, you know, my name is Pepper. I was just introduced. My role in Make Sense is the Asia Community Developer. I've been the community developer for Make Sense for over almost three years, actually, but have working in the develop have been working in the development sector for all, about like five years. Um, and my role in Make Sense is really to lead all of our citizen programs in the Philippines and across the region. I think some of our ambassadors or citizens are in this call, so hello everybody. And I really focus on supporting training and mobilizing our ambassadors to act for the advocacies that they care most about by equipping them with tools. Hi, Pepper. I think we lost your audio. Okay, we're just trying to connect with Pepper. Yeah, w welcome to the new normal. <laughs> All right, so we're waiting for Pepper, yeah. Okay, again, um, so we just started our um, program. So I've just introduced uh, the webinar. So this is a webinar series. So this is the first topic for this series um, organized by the Department of Social Development Services from the College of Human Ecology, UPLB. Okay. All right. So um, if you have registered we and also participated, we'll also uh, share with you um, the evaluation form, which is just a quick evaluation form. And then after that, we'll send you the e-certificate. So we'll issue an e-certificate for those who actively participated. And we thank you very much for being with us today. So, all right. And don't forget, if you have questions uh, uh, with our speakers, uh, please do post it in the Q&A button there. So you just click it and then type it away. Please do indicate to whom you'd like to address the question. You, you could also mention that uh, it's addressed to everyone if, if you'd like all the speakers to answer it as well. All right, I think, uh, hi Pepper, yeah. We're just having some problems with our connection with Pepper. Okay. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. We're seeing a lot of posts now. So I think some of you have, uh, some of you are students, some of you are our alumni. Uh, most of you are colleagues of Pepper, uh, Joe, Ea, and um, Jello as well. So this is in partnership with UNDP, with Make Sense. Um, and other organizations like 2030 Youth Force and STPB, TF Cure of UPLB.
All right. So, okay. So I think we've lost pepper for a bit. Okay, so that would be a problem. If it's okay for Aya to proceed, so maybe, um, because I think um, Pepper is still hooking up through the internet, yeah? So we'll proceed to our second speaker and then when Pepper comes back, then we'll just return to Pepper's sharing, okay? All right, so our second speaker is um, Ea from the National Convener of the 2030 Youth Force Philippines, yeah? Okay, I'll share my screen. Can you hear me, Ms. Jenny? Yes, Ea, loud and clear. Thank you, all right, okay. Ready. Hi everyone. So, mm -hmm. Okay, I'll proceed. Um, hi everyone, I'm A. Antonio. I'm the National Convener of the 2030 Youth Force in the Philippines. And this afternoon, I'll discuss how our organization has shifted our volunteer work since the pandemic started and actually um, aggravated um, last week. So just a... Ms. Ms. Jenny has mentioned earlier the work of the youth force. We are focusing on the mobilization of young people to help accelerate the achievement of the global goals through actual work on the ground. And to have a recap for everyone on the SDGs, these are the 17 goals of for sustainable development anchored on three pillars also of social justice, environment protection, and economic growth. So our work um, our projects and programs are anchored on the targets for these 17 goals. Just a background of the, on the organization, we started with a simple Facebook post. So in 2016, uh, Jules Guillaume, our founder in the Philippines, posted this call on Facebook, as you see on your screen, asking for young people who are... Um, interested in doing work for sustainable development. And this is after a workshop um, conducted by, a Uni by UNDP um, for the SDGs. And from there, we've grown to now 3,400 registered member advocates present across the Philippines. So we, are, we have presence in 17 regions, although um, these are the 10 regions where we are represented right now, or that we have focal persons and um, established chapters. So NCR, Region 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, Caraga Region, Region 10, and we're starting with BARM. Although um, some local efforts have been stopped because of the pandemic, and we'll discuss how we are shifting. Um, other than that, we have SDG ambassadors who functions as our project consultants to make sure that we are aligned with the targets that we really want to achieve and that we are contributing to the awareness campaigns for the global goals. And we have an open membership throughout the year, so we don't have um, applications that happen per batch. So anyone, we want to make sure that anyone who wants to work for sustainable development can easily volunteer through our um, open application process. So you just have to register online. Uh, our vision is just really to empower the youth to work together for the improved quality of life for all. And this is through the achievement of the SDGs, hopefully by year 2030. And in the Philippines, um, this is how we do our work. Although we have chapters in different countries with different methodologies, 
Um, in the Philippines, we do our work by activating, mobilizing the youth in other sectors, by collaborating with different stakeholders and making sure that we have partnerships with government units and with the academe also and the business sector. And we also help educate young people or fellow young people on different causes and current events anchored and affected by the SDGs. Previously, these are some of the activities that we usually do. We do events, conferences, speaking engagements. We have booth activations in several youth-led um, activities and school-based activities. We also have community engagements. We have outreach activities, online campaigns, and we also participate in lobbying in Congress for um, policies, for policies that are supporting the SDGs. Um, for example, one of our community projects is Project Liab, where we installed solar lamps together with our partners in one of the communities in Mabalakat, Pampanga. And we also have stakeholder engagements. We help um, young students uh, understand the value of the SDGs. Maybe it may be high for for younger um, audiences, but uh, we try to make it understandable for them by, uh, by um, painting a picture of how it applies to them. And they interpret the SDGs through this mural that we created together with UNDP also. And we also participated in lobbying efforts. For, um, there is a resolution already passed in Congress supporting the SDGs, and there are two bills filed in the Senate on sustainable development which we are um, also waiting for um, its passage. So now I'll go to our response to COVID-19. Um, because of the limitations on mobility, we made sure that we participate in information drives and to ensure that um, we are being mindful of fake news. And we try to aggregate the information that we have and make it um, available to our primarily to our member advocates all over the country. And then we also participated in some webinars and entered partnerships, for example, with USAID and the Department of Health on the for the COVID-19 response webinar, primarily for the World Health Day, and also a UNFPA campaign on what the impact of COVID-19 is on the youth. And then other than that, we also aggregated information on donation drives and fundraising activities. Um, and this is how we participated in donation drives and fundraising activities and volunteer work, um, responding to the needs in the communities because we are not able to mobilize our members um, considering the, the threat on the health and well-being of many of our members. So we supported those who are already on the ground or have the capacity to um, deploy their people and to deploy for logistics um, they are capable on delivering those. And then, yes, we also have partnerships. Uh, ADB also has a hackathon coming up um, directly responding to the new normal. And there are also other webinars such as this one, a new platform for young people to stay engaged. And now here is really the reality that we have to face as an organization. First, we have accepted that there will be no public gathering until the end of the year. Previously, since we started our work in 2016, we've been going around the country doing our um, community engagements and SDG caravan, raising awareness on the SDGs and showing, guiding our fellow young people on how we can create projects on the ground. For example, there, from online campaigns, we've also had um, projects on beating plastic pollution, for example. But these are done with the people and the communities affected by these issues. So now that we cannot go around the country, we're shifting to online platforms. And also we acknowledge the limited reach, not all young people, even if the SDGs wanted to really make sure that we leave no one behind, we have limited reach because not everyone is online. But that doesn't mean that there's no opportunity for us to engage. So if there 
there's 7 million people online. There is that 7 million people to reach. And we try to, and that's what we're doing. We're maximizing our digital platforms and also through partnerships to really um, engage in campaigns and mobilization. And also, we have to acknowledge that people have different priorities, especially in these times. And how does it trickle down to our members? First, um, there is really a toll on the well-being and, men and mental health of our volunteers. Uh, some of our, although most of our members are doing our volunteer work part-time and their primarily, primary contributions would be their time, their resources, their skills, and their energy. They're the ones creating our publicity materials or campaign materials online. They're the ones staging our webinars and our focus group discussions and consultations, surveys, etc. And now, even that, um, it, with the many of our members who are young professionals would still have to work from home and deal with um, the realities that the pandemic has um, highlighted. Um, they have to prioritize their well-being. They also have to face the anxieties and also um, try to manage their energy and their time on focusing on other work. And this um, also has um, affected um, leadership challenges because we have to reorganize and give people the time off that they needed and manage um, the people who are still able to volunteer online. And we also have to acknowledge that because we have to stay home, we have to rely on the connectivity and the, the internet and the data available to our members as they stay home. And some of our members, for example, in Southern Philippines have difficulty um, going online for, for a period of time because there's no, there are no restaurants open for Wi-Fi, for example, or public spaces or internet shops, unlike before. Because if you're um, internet connection fails at home, you can still go out and find ways to connect. Um, but with this pandemic, we are on a lockdown. So uh, there are some connectivity issues. Even cell phone and mobile signals became a challenge for a time. And so there's also the concern of maintaining connection and sense of belongingness among youth volunteers. Um, our volunteers are here. They're, they are, we have members from 15 to 30 years old, and some of them are here for the sense of belongingness, fulfillment. They're exploring their skills. They're also exploring their potentials. But at the same time, they're doing this to feel connected and to be involved. And that is kind of hampered with the lack of physical um, gatherings and face-to-face -face connections that we have. So we try to adjust it by creating online fun games for our members, for example, just to make sure that every week we are still in touch and that these are some of the publicity material, these materials that you see on your screens or some of the ways that we keep our members involved. There are some energy saving tips, for example, responding to the um, said concerns on surge on electricity, for example, this one is available the list, the tips are available to the public also, but there are also some internal um, membership involvement programs for just to keep everyone um, in the loop and also informed. So we also ask, um, what can you do in the face of this pandemic on an individual level so they can just stay home or they can mobilize or they can start their own campaigns or information drives or they can start their own fundraising activities. And we, we try to engage them and guide them through those um, that through those actions. Um, what's next? In the next couple of months, uh, we would still see more online events and online discussions. Um, we're looking forward to hackathons. These are um, online um, marathon of some sort, trying to find solutions and trying to find new innovations um, in response to COVID-19. But this is targeted to the young people in the Philippines. And also, we will still have a climate action forum. Um, environment, it's World Environment Day on Friday, and this June we will celebrate Pride Month and the climate action and climate action. And then towards the end of the year, we'll still have our SDG Biennium Summit, which is our annual event. But all these things will be conducted online. 
at least until we see a clear go signal that everything and everyone will be safe. Um, we still have our online campaigns. These are some of the pages that you'd find on Facebook. Uh, CISID Pilipinas is for SDG 14, for example. And yeah, those things. And we have a podcast coming out. So we are exploring all multimedia content possible to get the message across to raise awareness on how young people can um, contribute to the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, whichever their advocacy is. And yeah, just to share with you as I wrap up, uh, we recognize that every person has a potential to contribute to society, but that and that by contributing to these potentials and enabling them, we can create a society that is more nurturing for the well-being of everyone because it creates a cycle. So as we face this pandemic, we acknowledge that uh, we have to take care of the well-being of our members and some people would really need some time off, some time off and we have to shift to what is manageable for our member advocates in this time. While at the same time, uh, making sure that we still provide capacity building activities for those who still want to continue doing work for, for the movement and for their advocacy. And yeah, so we still create platform for engagement and capacity building to help them create their own actions, even through this pandemic and beyond. We'll make sure of that. So that's it for my, for my end. And this is our contact contact information you can email us and yeah just visit us on facebook for the updated list of the things that um we can do with the youth course also um thank you very much Shea. that was a very nice yes. thin presentation but uh we do agree with you that in terms of the challenges now in terms of the connection we've experienced it firsthand but uh we're very glad that there's still a lot of activities uh coming through we see a lot of um messages and uh, notes for you um regarding on how they could participate so maybe in the q a we could discuss that further all right so thank you very much Aya. all right so uh, i think uh pepper is already here pepper could you hear us yes i can hear you well sorry all right. Okay, no problem, Pepper. All right, so we'll welcome again Pepper Limco Limpoco, the Asia Community Developer of Make Sense Philippines. Thank you, Ms. Jennifer. And just to make sure, um, I cut off right at the beginning, right? So maybe I could just start from the very beginning. Is yes. that right? Yes. All right, got it. Okay, this time around, I'm going to keep checking because a while ago, um, <laughs> I continued talking and I thought I was still on. <laughs> This I'm going to check the chat box if I ever, if you ever lose me again. Um, so I'll keep it there. And so you can see my screen now, right? All good. All good. Okay. Like what Ayo was mentioning, there's a lot of challenges that we are facing at the moment. And I'm sure a lot of you are facing the same thing as me, internet connection as well. But we're here. Uh, so good afternoon again, everybody. Thank you again for inviting Make Sense to be part of this program. Always super happy to share about our initiatives and to meet you guys, fellow people from the NGOs, from different organizations, from universities even. So very happy to be here. Let me just check the chat box real quick. Still sharing. Thanks so much for the updates. All right, my name is Pepper. Again, my role in Make Sense is the Asia Community Developer. I've been the community developer for almost three years, but I've been working in the development for about five years now. Um, and I really focus on supporting, training, and mobilizing our ambassadors to act for the advocacies that they care most about. And I do that by equipping them with the tools, connecting them to the resources and networks, uh, that really makes it easier for them to have concrete impact. And earlier, I was actually saying hello to some of the ambassadors that I recognize that are here with us today. So hello again. I hope this time I will cut off. I uh, just wanted to mention all of our citizen programs are for free and make sense because we want to make sure that change making is accessible to anyone and everybody. And so far as a community developer, it's been very exciting you know, being able to meet and work with various personalities and backgrounds. Uh, every day is unique as a community developer, as I'm sure some of you can relate. 
And so to begin with, let me tell you a little bit about Make Sense, especially for those of you who may have never heard of Make Sense before. Um, essentially, what we do at Make Sense is we provide training and support so that we can engage citizens towards the development of social innovation in the region and in the country. And we've been doing this for years. And how we do that exactly is in three parts. Firstly, we train for the 21st century skills. That's mainly training on design thinking, innovation, collaboration, and all these related subjects so that we can concretely solve the challenges of the world. And then secondly, we also incubate social startups through our incubation program that uh, is mostly focused on guiding their ideas towards you know, realization and to uh, ready them to be able to scale. And finally, we also focus on the development of communities and ecosystems, my favorite part, by training citizen ambassadors and other organizations to enable anyone to take part in social impact. So globally, Make Sense has engaged more than 250,000 citizens, supported 8,000 projects, and have partnered with more than 200 institutions. So we're very proud to be supported by some of the greatest inst institutions, such as the Obama Foundation, as you can see here, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as well. So we're an international organization. We, we, we were founded in, in Paris and France about 10 years ago, and we brought it to Asia about five years ago. And we have seven different offices in the different regions. So it's a very exciting time to be part of the community. In the Philippines, just wanted to add here, we were able to engage a good number of citizens, social entrepreneurs, and companies or organizations in our various programs, one of which is the UNDP. That's why I'm very happy to be here with Joe. Uh, we've been acting on the project that we have recently together, so that's very exciting. Um, and it's been an exciting time. All right, before I move forward, I'm just going to habitually check the, the comments that I'm sure I'm still on. All right. So that's what makes sense is and an overview of what we've been doing for the past five years and now moving on to the topic at hand, which is what does our citizen engagement model or the volunteerism model look like amidst this COVID-19 pandemic and for us, we put it under the umbrella of hashtag spread sense not Corona. Um, because that's exactly what we want to do. So first off, after much internal discussion and make sense, you know, we've been running programs and operations for the past five years. When this COVID-19 pandemic happened, we immediately saw that this crisis is more than just a sanitarian crisis, but really it's more of a humanitarian crisis. It extends to that. And what that means for us is that we need to respond to the current situation, of course, where the needs are more immediate, um, especially for at-risk communities or individuals and for our frontliners as well. But also this means that the effects will trickle down to more long-term challenges, especially in the issues of the things that I mentioned here, which are increasing poverty, inequality, uh, food security, isolation, issues on education and all those different things, as I'm sure you're all aware. And so for our organization, one thing was clear, we really needed to pivot the way that we run our operations and the way that we engage our community and build our programs. And so we need to respond immediately, but we also need to start co-building a more resilient ecosystem with our beneficiaries and partner NGOs. Let me know in the comments section if I ever cut off. And so taking into account the Make Sense expertise, the previous programs that we've already been running, the resources that we have, we knew that the best thing we can offer is to be a collaborative ecosystem for these different players of the social entrepreneurs, the NGOs, the citizens. And we can offer the solutions needed to fight COVID-19 and build the Philippine society post-coronavirus. And I know that's a handful of a, a statement, but concretely, this is what it looks like. So we put, we created these different programs um, under the umbrella of hashtag spread sense, not Corona. So for building a more, um, for helping with more immediate needs, we built reaction. For building a more long-term program focused on healthcare systems, we have health for all that we've been running for a while now. And for the platform to collaborate on this new world we wanna build, we made Make Sense TV. For this talk, I'll actually just focus on the two programs, Reaction and Make Sense TV, because these are the two things where our citizen ambassadors are most involved with. And so heading on to that topic, again, I mentioned we, were, we, had, we noticed that we had to shift our programs. We decided that we need to pivot. And what this meant is that 
you know, our previous programs and make sense for the community specifically, uh, were at least three to six months in length, involved this whole process for selection for ambassadors, had many processes involved and usually took about two months to prepare. You know, it usually takes time to prepare a program. You have to prepare the logistics, you know, to mobilize communications, designing the program, et cetera. But we didn't have that time, obviously, because we needed to launch a program ASAP that could help out in the COVID-19 initial lockdown that we had. And at the same time, we needed to take into account the interests of the community that has changed. They weren't interested anymore in co-organizing hackathons and brainstorming sessions. They were asking us if there was a way to help families with no access to water, if there was a way to help people with deep mental trauma, to help frontliners lacking equipment and many other things. And so the reaction program was built and launched within a week. And as you can imagine, the program was very lean, Nothing was perfect. We were learning, ideating, iterating along the way, but it was something that was working and at the very least something that was producing impactful results. And so we focus on three themes, which is vulnerable communities, the first picture you see, frontliners, and also isolated individuals who were in need of mental health support. Awesome, that's it. I got a yes for my video is still on. Okay, so Reaction specifically is a one week, 100% online program that allows anyone and everyone to help out while at home. So basically you just sign up for the program through our website where you can either choose to be part of the communities team, the frontliners team or the mental health team. Then you're invited to a kickoff call every Monday where we explain to you the context. We introduce to you the beneficiaries or partner NGOs and we show you the library of tasks. And this is what the library of tasks looks like. It's just a big list of simple tasks that you can choose from to do every day for one week. So for example, you can choose to cook meals for frontliners yourselves, such as what I think Josh and Kyle did. You can also choose to find gloves for volunteer drivers or whatever. Our volunteers can pick and choose which tasks they wanna do every day for one week to contribute in any way that they can. And so in this regard, they're given the liberty to choose based on their schedules or contexts. And you know, some may be more comfortable to cook, some may be more comfortable to call individuals in need of mental health support. So you're really free to choose from yourself. And you're also free to choose and adapt the tasks into bigger projects and online programs. And I'll show you some of the examples of how ambassadors did that later on. And so, like I said, we had about 300 uh, volunteers at this point split into the three different themes of frontliners, communities, and mental health, each with their own list of partner NGOs and each with their own library of tasks. And a lot of our volunteers are either university students whose classes have stopped and therefore have more time in the day to be involved, or young professionals who are working from home and could contribute on their free time, basically. And although a lot of our previous citizen ambassadors signed up for the program as well, a bulk of the volunteers for reaction have never actually engaged with Make Sense before, which I think just emphasizes the fact that many Filipinos across the country are really motivated, I'm sure you guys are too, to be part of initiatives such as this one due to the current crisis. And so I think it's really imperative that we are able to offer them accessible and simple to follow um, and an impactful platform to give the, the, the effort that they'd like to give. And so this slide just shows what a week in the life of a reaction participant looks like. And it just goes something like, you know, they get acquainted with the program by the start of the week or the weekend to our call for participants. If you sign up, you're invited to a kickoff call on Monday where the first tasks are assigned, meaning you choose the first task you want to do. They are added to their respective Facebook groups and WhatsApp channels where we post our updates every 7 p.m. every day. We have checkup calls and coaching calls midweek for those who may need some support or are facing challenges or are just simply asking for, oh, Pepper, can you give me tips on how I can continue fundraising, what I can cook next, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and by Friday, we have a celebration call to obviously celebrate everybody's achievements. And it's this point that you can choose as a volunteer if you want to continue volunteering for the next week or if you would prefer to drop the program. Either way, we're just very happy to have had you for one week. But amazingly, a lot of our volunteers are actually have been here for five weeks. So they continually um, engage in reaction, which makes me very, very happy. And I mentioned earlier that there are some examples of how people took that 
opportunity to adapt and to create co-build the program with us. And this is some of the examples. There are so many, but these are some. Um, and these are initiatives that really further their engagement more. So this you see in your screen, and I hope you still do, is the communities team who put together this, this online music festival to support the communities that needed access to water. So maybe some of you are aware, but there's a lot of families who are suffering from no access to water and are unable to get that access because of the lockdown. Hopefully that's lessened with now our GCQ. But what the community did is they invited performers, you know, singers, DJs, many others to give their time and talent uh, online, obviously, for these families in need. And with just this Facebook Live of people performing, cool pictures here, I could never understand what this is all about, but maybe some of you are into music do. Um, and this is another picture. They were able to raise about 50,000 pesos in just one session of this two hour jamming. <laughs> so that's pretty cool, right? Another thing that they did was the creative geniuses. And this is so amazing. Of the Frontliners team decided to build Frontline. This is the name of the, of the initiative. Art for a Cause, wherein you can commission an artwork from a volunteer artist. This is some examples. And all of the proceeds, 100%, goes to providing equipment, food, and transportation to the frontliners that we have in various hospitals. So the volunteers became so creative, so proactive once we gave them the resources and the space to do so. I think that's very cool. Let me also give you some examples of our partner NGOs, just in case some of you are part of NGOs that are working with communities that maybe could partner with us. Um, and this is some of the ways that our impact of the volunteers were able to help them. So Accessi Wheels uh, is a platform that uh, enables people with mobility problems, you know, like people who use a wheelchair, uh, to be where they need to be. So they connect these individuals who have mobility problems to train drivers or to people with accessible vehicles to ensure that they get to where they need to be and to travel safely. And so the main mandate of Accessi Wheels during the lockdown was to get as many individuals, many patients who needed to get medical treatment to the hospital. I'm sure you guys have seen this news where a lot of people are walking, people in wheelchairs are being pushed miles to get to the hospital. And so Accessi Wheels tries to solve that problem such as you know, for patients who need dialysis, this is something you need to get to the hospital to. So through the reaction program, through the volunteers, we were able to help them to have at least 500 rides to the hospital. So that's 500 patients who can get to the hospital for dialysis, for medical treatments, et cetera. Another organization we help is Supportal. That's a platform for mental health wellness that really is focused on supporting mentally vulnerable individuals during the lockdown. And during for reaction, so far we've been able to train more than 20 mental health advocates on the proper process of how you do what we call empathy calls for those who need it. And these 20 mental health advocates were able to do at least 100 empathy calls and put together different webinars on promoting well-being. And also like they had a virtual open mic last Saturday as well. So I won't give you all of the examples, but these are just some pictures you might want to see. This is a picture of Grinellas, a sustainable slipper brand that um, basically uh, hires low-income uh, PWD individuals. And through the reaction program, we were able to help all 20 employees of Green Ellis with food, equipment, and other resources that they otherwise could not be able to get because if you're a PWD, it makes you so much more challenging to live during the lockdown. You know, even getting out is much more difficult. So we were able to help them. For Uproot Urban, Urban Farms, we were able to put together more than 200 kilos of fruits and vegetables that was distributed to more than 400 families. Very happy about that. And I think this is my last example. With Water for Life, we were able to provide 200 families with access to water. And again, all of this is through online action by the 300 volunteers scattered across Metro Manila and across the Philippines. So again, it's really online action with offline impact. And then here, uh, we're very, very, great, very, very grateful to have received some recognition for the work we've been doing from local channels such as Net25. That's me in the bottom left doing my first virtual TV interview, which was a very interesting experience. Um, but even to CNN, to Obama Foundation, uh, we're very happy that reaction was, you know, overall a quick response to the unprecedented situation that we all found ourselves in. And so we're thankful that it was able to create the impact that we wanted to have. 
And moving forward, we're still in the process of iterating the program to shift to the more long-term issues. The ones I mentioned earlier, focusing on job security, food security, other themes that are affecting us long-term. And so we're preparing actually to launch this new version of Reaction in one week. I'm currently working on it, working very hard, I promise you. And now we're looking for more organizations that are working with communities or vulnerable groups to become partner NGOs, just like Accessi Wheels, Greenellas, Uproot Urban Farms, et cetera. And we're also looking for volunteers. So we really wanna expand our reach, our impact through partner NGOs that are already doing so much work on the ground. I'm sure many of you are doing so much work and we wanna get every Filipino involved in this initiative. So if you're interested to be part of the journey, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm gonna show my email again at the end of the presentation, but really quickly, I wanted to run through and briefly mention another literal platform that we created the past two months, which is Make Sense TV. And through Make Sense TV, we really hope to reinvent the way we interact online, especially as we foresee events to be held online for at least the next six months, I would say, like, like this one we're in currently. And what makes sense TV is, is essentially just a platform in the website. So if you go to philippines.makesense.org, the local version of it, you'll see it in our main bar. And um, it's really just something that we are concurrently running while we're running Reaction because we wanna continue building this online ecosystem. We've built the offline ecosystem, but now that it's impossible, it's time to think about how we continue the online ecosystem um, of these things that events like this one, trainings, webinars, different types of engagements that again, anyone and everyone needs to be part of, right? And there's a lot of challenges that comes to this, of course, with accessibility, but comes with other challenges on internet connection, all these different things. Um, but again, the solution does not come from one organization. It's all of us working together to find the solution for it. Um, so on this, many of the recent webinars and trainings we've had on Make Sense TV were actually organized and facilitated by Make Sense Citizen Ambassadors on a variety of topics that they personally care about. We recently had one on the topic of emerging technologies amidst the pandemic. We had one on urban mobility and so far and so forth. Um, let me also just double check. I'm sorry, I keep double checking the chat box just to make sure you guys don't lose me because I don't want to be talking to myself. But besides the webinars from both the local and national network of experts and doers that we have, we also release things such as the inspirational podcasts that feature really cool organizations and individuals working for social impact. So um, I guess it just really goes to show that there's so much that we can create if we collaborate with more actors in the ecosystem, as much, much of us as possible. I know I'm very glad with this webinar, we have the UPLD school as a, as a university, we have UNDP, we have organizations such as Make Sense, the others who are other speakers as well, who are really collaborating with, you know, coming from different expertise and backgrounds. And also, it, it just goes to show that all you need is a platform to do so, to do this collaborative effort on, because it, it just makes sense for all of us to work together, especially at a time like this. And um, for those who are wondering, this is actually the very reason why we call our organization Make Sense, because it just makes sense for all of us to work together. <laughs> I hope you got a laugh out of that, but I, I usually always do it. I've been here for so long, I still laugh with the fact that we're called Make Sense. All right, um, I'd like to end this. I'm not sure if I took more than 15 minutes, so I apologize for that, but I just wanna end with this slide that I think it's worth noting that there's really an amazing power to communities, depending on how you create, facilitate, sustain yours. And it's so exciting for me to think about how communities can help you do so many things from helping you fundraise for vegetables, donating, cooking together for many other things. I think that communities are really so cool. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a community developer myself, but also the reality is that it's hard work. It takes a lot of testing and learning along the way. There's no, there's no magic recipe to community building and it's not a one size fits all model. Um, communities are as unique as the people in them. So really context is key. And in my end, I think uh, the best tip I, I could give you guys for those who are in organizations trying to build or are building the community is to listen. So to listen to your context and your ecosystem, but most especially to listen to the people who are part of your communities or are part of the communities you're trying to build, you know, understanding what's important for them, listening to what they're interested to contribute to, how can you co-build together? And this is how we build reaction and make sense TV. And I hope that you guys will join us. So 
as promised, I'll show you guys how you can do exactly that. For reaction, we're looking for NGOs to partner with, beneficiaries and volunteers. For make sense, we're looking for more people who'd like to co-organize. And so um, we have actually two upcoming events on Thursday and Friday. On Thursday, we have the recap, which is a celebration of the reaction program in the past five months, five weeks, I mean. And then we also have a World Environment Day um, event, which is in partnership with Aveda. There's going to be two lucky winners, by the way, of gift packs from Aveda Philippines. So please do join us. If you're interested to be part of these events, you can head on to facebook.com slash make sense BH. These are our other handles. And if you want to reach out, please don't hesitate to do so. Again, my email is Patricia. It's not Pepper. It's Patricia at makesense.org. Please reach out to me on anything um, with any possible collaborations or if you want to volunteer, I'd be very happy to respond to you. And again, thank you so much for having us in, in this talk. And I hope I stayed until the very last minute. Uh, back to you, Ms. Jennifer. Thank you, Pepper. You had us with Avida, so <laughs> no, just all right. Yeah, well, we do agree with you in terms of uh, sense making is very critical at this time because most of the time uh, things are kind of senseless, uh, like being locked up in in you know in our house for a long time. But we really need it. But yeah, uh, but for others, it's kind of challenging as well. What uh, I think what uh, a takeaway from your talk as well is uh, I'd like to call it three C's. One is the choice. We see that in your presentation, there's a lot of choice uh, where volunteers could choose uh, their tasks or activities. Same with what uh, AF have shared as well. And it's also very important to celebrate. No? Sometimes we forget after, you know, um, celebrating or after volunteering, we, we try to forget or, you know, um, to celebrate as well our milestones and a way to connect with other volunteers as well. All right. And maybe I could quote Jason Luna, who's our alumni from the College of Human Ecology, online action with offline impact. So that's my, not my quote. It's Jason Luna. So, all right. So thank you very much again uh, for the Q&A. Uh, we have a portion for that after Joe's uh, talk. So we go now to uh, Jello, Cesar Angelo Origue, who's the spokesperson for the UPLB Serve the People Brigade Task Force here. Go ahead, Jello. Okay, hello, Paul. Good afternoon. Wait a second. Stop sharing. All right, so TFQ is based in UPLB and they've been doing lots of um, terrific work to help uh, not only the UPLB community, but also the nearby communities here in Osmania. So go ahead, Jello. Yeah. Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Um, yes. All good. We hear you, Jello. And good afternoon. I'm Cesar Angelo Origue, the current spokesperson for Task Force Cure or Serve the People Brigade Task Force Cure or Community Unit Response. And I'm also the current Public Relations Officer of the University Student Council of UPLB. And I'm here to discuss about student-led efforts during, the, during this pandemic. And also I'm gonna be focusing mainly in the collective community response that we practice in pushing forward this advocacy of ours. So here is the cure's beginnings, early days of relief, the relief ops under the lockdown. Task Force Cure was convened on March 16, 2020, a day before the lockdown in Laguna, the EC, day before the ECQ in Laguna by the members of the UPLB USC, the Alliance Samana Kabataan Para Sabayan, and Youth Advocates for Peace with Justice. Bale, ang nangyari po, parang alam naman na, natin na pinaka-maaapektuhan talaga sa mga ganitong sakuna or sa kahit anong sakuna ay yung pinaka-basic sectors of our community. And ang pinaka-malapit po na community sa atin ay ang community ng Los Baños. Kaya doon po, not just the students yung pinag-focusan ng planning namin nung unang araw, but instead, sinama po namin ang mga nearby communities sa ating university. And, 
Cure was built on the principle that responses to calamity should always be community-oriented since the pandemic primarily affects not just individuals but also communities. Ayun po, isa sa mga natutunan namin sa the principles ng social technology is uh, sustainable na practices in the community, parang empowering communities para maging self-propelling yung community. Kaya ayun po yung parang isa sa mga naging model ng ng relief operations ng Serve the People Brigade. Kaya ayun po, nung start po ng lockdown in UPLB, nag-consult po kami agad sa Barangay Batong Malaki, which is the barangay na kinabibilangan ng university, and was welcomed with a positive partnership. And since then, CURE promotes the spirit of helping the, the community. Its orientation is not just for the UPLB, but for the whole Los Banos community. And as of today, we've reached various barangays within the Los Banos, and even we've reached other municipalities like Bay and in Kabuya. Task Force Cure's main alliance, Serve the People Brigade UPLB, has a rich history of helping all around Southern Tagalog. Since its convention back in 1972, during the suspension of Crit of Habeas Corpus, it has never ceased to serve the people. Ang isa po sa mga pinakaunang naging launching ng Serve the People Brigade this year ay yung nagkaroon ng student-led efforts ang buong UPLB community along with the Los Banos community as well para mag-relief po sa nangyaring Taal eruption. Makita po natin dito sa picture, ayan, parang nagtulong-tulong yung mga estudyante na, na nandito noon para mag, ano, mangalap ng donations and meron din po tayong pinapadalang mga volunteers sa mga sa mga relief centers sa may part ng Batangas. Ayun po yung naging main... Tapos yung student union building po yung parang naging main center po ng donations and relief. Ayun po. Next po. Project Cure or LB Lockdown Diaries and more. And the day Cure was convened, LB Lockdown Diaries was also born, adapted from the FB group hashtag Lockdown Diaries. The group was created for the purpose of easier communication within the community amidst the pandemic. Aside from that, it also serves as an online support group where members can talk about their experiences during the lockdown. Bale, hindi lang siya naging platform para mag-mobilize ng community. Naging platform din siya para mag magkwentuhan yung community. Kasi na nabago yung dynamics natin bilang mga tao when the pandemic happened. Like, yung normal chismisa ng mga kapitbahay ay hindi na natin nagagawa because of the quarantine and because of social distancing. Kaya parang yung kumustahan natin ay, and banters ay na-suppress na tayo into an online mode. Kaya ganun po yung tinatry natin igawa sa, sa LB Lockdown Diaries. We try to communicate as much as possible, even about the mundane things na kamusta dyan sa street nyo or... Meron pa bang mga estudyante na naiwanan dito sa Los Banos nung nag-lockdown? And as of today, LB Lockdown Diaries has almost 8,900 members. And mga, mga, ano, mga malapit po sa UPLB and mga estudyante ng UPLB. Cure also uses online platform for teaching the basics of COVID-19 and how to prevent it. It has also launched series called Cure Talks where members of the Task Force Cure discuss timely topics as such as We Heal as One Act and on the President's Special Powers. Bale, hindi lang po tayo nag-uusap nag on what can we do during this pandemic, but we also discuss the, the certain policies and politics revolving around the pandemic that is happening in, the, in our country. And kasama rin sa mga na-discuss natin sa Cure Talks ay yung possible na lalamanin ng mga bags na ipamimigay natin sa community and what to donate. Ayan. Information gathering. Aside from the information dissemination, one of the Cure's first project was to conduct a survey to determine the community's basic needs. Kasi hindi lang naman tayo pwede magbigay lang ng tulong ng feeling natin kung ano yung kailangan ng community. Kailangan scientific yung yung pagtulong natin sa community. Kailangan, yung totoong kailangan nila, yung maibigay natin na tulong. 
kaya nung March 17, once the Luzon was put in total lockdown, the thing we first did was to determine how many students were left stranded in UPLB. Ang nangyari po kasi noon, parang late nag-announce ng suspension of classes ang UPLB. Kaya marami rin na-stranded mga estudyante in UPLB. Kaya inalam natin kung ano yung mga kailangan ng mga students inside the UP dormitories. Inalam din natin kung sino pa yung mga estudyante ang nasa mga apartments within the vicinity of the university. Ayun po yung mga ginawa natin. And next is establishing a physical center. For the first few days of the Cure Relief Ops, we tried to make the Student Union Building as our physical center. Drop-off points were later moved to the UP gate, then finally found a home at Barangay Batong Malaki Covered Court. In partnership with our local government units, and Batong Malaki catered for our needs and still acts as our headquarters until today. Bale, ayun po, salamat po kay, kay Cap Ian Kalaw sa pagtanggap po sa sa STVB Task Force Cure bilang official partner or isa sa mga official relief arm ng Barangay Batong Malaki. And from that, nakapag-develop po tayo ng mga networks sa different key barangays ng Los Baños at saka sa mismong municipal office po ng Los Baños. Food drives and community kitchens. Once the lockdown was implemented, a lot of establishment started closing included doon yung mga food establishments. Kaya important po na mag-provide ng free hot meals sa mga students right away since most of them do not have access to public transport and are bound to curfew. Cure's first distribution was on March 18. Hot meals were provided by the locals for the students. Ayan, mga, ang mga nag-provide po ng mga hot meals for the students ay yung mga families na mga nag-volunteer sa atin na magluluto sila. I believe it's from Mizpe, yung restaurant po inside the campus. Parang ayun, sila yung family na nag, na nag try mag-shoulder ng food for a few weeks into the lockdown. Tapos ayun, data from the surveys and various crowdsourcing from the LB Lockdown Group helped in choosing our beneficiaries as well as establishing our routes ng mga dadaanan ng food drive. All food distribution were made possible by transport volunteers ranging from students to our own professors. During the distribution, and social distancing is always observed. Pakita po natin, pinapapila natin sila maayos. Tapos lahat po ng, ano, lahat ng mga mga transport natin, lahat ng mga nagdi-distribute ay mga volunteers po lahat. Kaya ayun po, maraming salamat po at na-mobilize natin ng maayos yung community natin para maging possible itong mga. And as the weeks went by, Cure has also decided to initiate community kitchens for the students. Then later joined Art Relief Mobile Kitchen in providing hot meals for the community. During its peak, we had three community kitchens running all at the same time. Ayan. Donations. Here started its donation drive the day it was convened. During its early days, call for donations for resources in kind were the first one to be established. As we expand our relief efforts, we have also called for help in sustaining our community kitchens and also providing for PPEs to our frontliners. Mga frontliners po, halimbawa, nagbibigay rin tayo ng mga PPEs sa mga nagbabantay sa mga borders and sa mga hospitals na malalapit dito sa Los Baños, even mga hospitals, mga public and private hospitals na malapit sa municipality of Bae, ganyan. Nag-reach out din po tayo sa kanila. The incure transparency is key to provide a tracker for us and also a way for our donors to see how and where their contributions landed. Weekly and monthly finance and donation reports are publicly released on our Facebook and Twitter page. Ayan, makita po natin. And naglalab, like, we try to be as transparent as possible sa mga donations na pumapasok po sa amin. And daily operations are also logged through, our, through daily posts and documentations. Aside from providing meals to the community, we also give back to our frontliners by providing PPEs to various local government units. Tapos hindi lang po 
donations ng mga PPE yung yung napapamigay natin kundi yung mga PPE na handmade ng mga volunteers yung mga ginagawa mismo ng mga volunteers nagkakaroon po tayo ng workshop kung paano gumawa ng PPE para kapag halimbawa po yung mga ibang volunteers ay nasa community kitchen yung ibang volunteers naman po ay nag naggagawa ng PPEs or nag nagmamando ng educational discussions about the pandemic itself. And six, alliances. To ensure its mandate to expand community-based response, CURE has also partnered with local alliances such as CURE COVID Calabarzon, which is the region-wide relief effort for, for the Southern Tagalog. Ayan. Advocacies. Our first, first advocacy is No Student Left Behind. It's about the to end the SEM and, pa, and mass promotion. Ayun po isa sa mga naging, naging campaign ng SCPB Cure kasi naniniwala po tayo na sa panahon po ng pandemic, parang ang main priority natin is our safety, not, not other things. Kaya ayun po yung No Student Left Behind. And hashtag community response. And it's our advocacy to ensure that we involve the community in our relief efforts para alam din nila or, ano, kung paano nila masusustain itong mga ganitong, mga ganitong efforts when another time comes na magkaroon ng ganitong pandemic para maging self-propelling sila in the near future. And ayun po, the, the key to every effective pandemic response is mass testing. And Up until now, we are still advocating for, for, and we're still encouraging our government to uphold mass testing now in our country para malaman natin kung, kung si ilan pa talaga yung numbers at sino pa dapat yung mga quarantine and ayun, ayun po yung... And that's all. The Collective Community Response of Task Force Cure, Stories of Relief, Hope, and Real Bayanihan. And if you want to partner with our organization, you can check our Facebook page that Serve the People Brigade and you can message us there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jello. Um, I think the UPLB community and Los Banos community is very grateful for STPB, uh, TF Cure for your initiatives. And I think, uh, again, the, the insights from your presentation, number one, uh, very great that you shared about transparency uh, because sometimes when you donate or you volunteer your time, you don't know where, what's the impact. So it's very critical uh, that you share and communicate that to the volunteers and the owners as well. Uh, second is the evidence-based uh, um, sharing that you've mentioned. So uh, you have a survey, so it's uh, really based on what the people need. And third one is uh, actually promoting giving back mentality. Uh, the beneficiaries helping out other uh, th of those in need as well, those who participated in the community kitchen, something like that. So congratulations again, Jello. So, uh, all right. So, okay. So we have a lot of questions, but before we go to the questions, some of them are directly being answered by our speakers. Uh, they're typing some of the questions now, uh, uh, answers now, but we will have a Q&A later. So just to provide an insight in terms of the learnings that we got from our three speakers, um, very succinct presentations, but very jump, uh, it's uh, full of, uh, you know, insights, full of lessons, full of inspiration. So we'd like to call on Joe. Uh, Joe Aroba from uh, UNDP to provide um, the synthesis as well as how do we move forward in terms of promoting volunteerism during these times. Take it away, Joe. Hi. Let me just share my screen. And hopefully, you can all see the screen. It's not showing up on video. Okay, naman. Okay. Oh, that's not <laughs> um, Okay, so, um, well, I was introduced earlier, but um, hello again, I'm Johanna or Joe. I'm uh, the Youth Engagement Officer of, UN, uh, United, of the United Nations Development Program in the Philippines. Um, I'm also a 
U United Nations Volunteer um, Specialist. Um, for the past year, in 2019, I was um, a UN Youth Volunteer. And I'm really happy to um, be part of this conversation and I'm happy to see and, and see the uh, fellow speakers here who, whom I've worked with already in the past. So the, the presentation really is about um, more of a synthesis and um, uh, sharing what my key takeaways are from what uh, the three speakers have shared. And uh, I'd like to call this um, a recipe for uh, volunteerism. And I assume we have different audiences here, like you can be interested in volunteering or you can be part of an organization who wants to um, organize your own volunteering efforts. And, and hopefully you'll find um, these takeaways useful. So the first thing I wanted to, to really highlight is um, that volunteerism should be intentional. Um, so when you volunteer or when you initiate your own um, project, for example, what is your intent? Um, do you have objectives? Who are your target beneficiaries? And I like that Aya earlier mentioned about visioning and targeting youth volunteers. Um, Jello also mentioned that um, they expanded the scope of their um, initiative to target not just the school, right, but the whole UPLB community. Um, and 2030 Youth Force also mentioned targeting the policy side and engaging other stakeholders. So not just youth where they, uh, they, work, they work primarily. Um, and then of course, having the sustainable development goals as an anchor. And another thing that was mentioned earlier, I think um, by, by the speakers also and, and Ms. Jen was, the importance, but I think someone from the Q and A section, and I hope I was I would be able to answer this. But um, there was a question on uh, evaluation, and so I think um, part of being intentional is figuring out how you measure your results, and that has a lot to do with monitoring and evaluation. And I'll talk about that later in transparency and communication. So the next the next ingredient in this recipe is um, that volunteerism is realistic. So. Um, I think all of us need to keep grounded. We have to assess the needs of the community or the people around us and the people we want to serve, but also assess our capabilities as an organization, as a, an individual volunteer. And again, Aya earlier mentioned, um, she had a slide about the realities that we face. Um, even Make Sense had a present, one of the slides also had, um, uh, they had Pepper highlighted, um, how they pivoted their um, programs in, in this time of, of crisis. And we all have um, our own um, realities to face, right? So some of the challenges that were mentioned earlier were on mobility, mental health. Um, but I think um, in terms of being realistic, also we need to observe protocols and be sensitive on volunteers' needs, especially on health. Um, the other ingredient is part, uh, that volunteerism is participatory. So I'd like to put emphasis on grassroots and community-based initiatives, which is like a for the people, by the people um, initiative, and really um, making sure that you are listening to what is around you and not just um, creating your own bubble, because ultimately you are there to serve um, your community, right? And I'd like, what Jello shared earlier about the community-based initiatives that they have. And of course, um, one of the things that we really advocate is, the, is how can we leave no one behind and how do we reach the farthest first? So that falls under um, the participatory sphere. And the next one would be resource efficient. Um, I think this was also raised by Aimee Sh Sherry Barlon. Um, so when we say resource efficient, it's really, um, I, I'd like to highlight that it's using all kinds of resources, so not just funds or financial, but treating volunteers as a very important human resource. And again, um, as, a, as a youth advocate also, um, we em put emphasis on youth civic engagement. Uh, if you don't know yet, there are 30% of us in the Philippines. So we, we are a really strong um, popula uh, population. Uh, and then um, really like, 
I was amazed by Make Sense's effort, like from starting from zero to hero, right? And it started with a, and even Aya shared how 2030 Youth Corps started with a Facebook post. And um, so going back to what, what I may ask about donor fatigue, I would like to say like, what is your intention when it comes to um, sourcing out for donors, right? If it's resource mobilization, again, it has a lot to do with partnerships and not just necessarily funding. So you can still do a lot, as you can see with what, what the earlier presenters said, you can still do a lot even with very few resources or um, funds in that sense. The next ingredient would be transparency uh, and, and accountability to your stakeholders, especially if you have donors or um, may it be like um, your, through your donation drives or institutional donors, for example, or when you're given grants, it's important that you report on the resources. And I like that it was highlighted earlier by Jello um, doc on documentation and really communicating your results. And that leads me to my next ingredient for this recipe, which is communication. And communication is really building a case um, and communicating your wins, reaching the farthest first and making sure that your materials are well targeted and again, intentional. So it, I won't go through the branding um, stuff, right? And the designs and making sure that they capture the targeted audience and being intentional with your advocacy campaigns. And um, it was also mentioned earlier that we've all been leveraging on social media with the advent of technology and how can you use these readily available tools for social listening, such as surveys, which Jalo shared earlier, um, and how can you make sure that you're curating relevant content um, when it comes to your social media um, posts. And the last, and definitely for me, the most important is collective action. And highlighting, this is highlighting partnerships and leveraging on, on what's already there. So it's not really, Yes, you can you can develop your own initiative from ground up, but really, who are people that are already working on things that you're passionate about, and what can you how can you add value to that? Right? Instead of creating um, something else or maybe um, being redundant, but really, how can you work together to um, have a more value added um, benefits? And so. Jello mentioned earlier about collective community response and community consultation. Aya mentioned about um, networking and engaging remotely. And uh, the same goes for Make Sense and what Pepper said earlier. There. So I'm really not used to, <laughs> to um, yeah, there. Uh, the next, uh, I'll, more than this synthesis and the takeaways from the earlier presentation, I also wanted to share my own personal experience and my work as a volunteer, not just within the United Nations, but um, even in the previous engagement. So the photos that you'll see there are photos of me and um, scenarios that have, um, experiences that I've had in, in, the pre in my previous engagements. Um, I've in, my first job was actually with a humanitarian agency. And so I worked there for almost two years. And um, when there's a, a crisis, like usually it's typhoons. I come from Tacloban city. So we have we experience a lot of um, typhoons from Yolanda to Nona to Ruby. And I've, I've been deployed in um, emergency missions. Also, in, if you remember the Nepal earthquake, we've set up office there for two months. And so um, they had us fly there to, to help with emergency response. And that's the photo you see on the upper right. Um, so I mentioned earlier that I'm a UN uh, volunteer and I primarily handle youth engagement for the uh, UNDP. Um, and I coordinate a project ca called Youth Collab. We are working on um, youth leadership, innovation and entrepreneurship and just the um, it's not in the slides, but I wanted to share um, that we have a um, youth collab movers, which is also something we're, we're working on to implement in the Philippines, like engaging um, young volunteers to uh, promote the sustainable development goals from the grassroots level. So um, this, is, this is a very recent photo um, in one of the uh, field 
exposures that we that I've um, participated in as a volunteer inside the, the, the organization. And some of the four key lessons that I've learned during my experience as a volunteer throughout the five years. Um, really, uh, so I, this is um, this is what the lessons I've learned are. And um, I think, especially if, if um, you're working in extremely difficult situations, um, I, I would say this as a, um, a worker in the humanitarian or development um, sector, security, safety and security always comes first. And in, in organizing your volunteer initiatives, um, I think it's important that we are mindful of that. So that goes to um, health in all forms, physical, mental, and emotional. And I'd like to highlight that you sh we should always be um, uh, conscious about the health and well-being, safety, and security of the of our volunteers, of the stakeholders, and the beneficiaries that we serve. Um, another lesson I've learned is agility. And especially if you're in a, an extremely stressful situation and you're in an emergency crisis, you're volunteering and no day is the same. Um, emergency situations often require agility and creativity and innovation. And finally, um, it's important to set your expectations. Again, uh, keeping grounded and communicating with the people around you, treating them as your support system. So it's important that you have people to talk to, um, maybe your colleagues or co-volunteers, um, your volunteer coordinator, for example. And that was demonstrated earlier by Pepper when she mentioned about the checkup calls that they, they would have um, whenever a volunteer needs um, support. So the next thing I, I wanted to share was um, the uh, is, is UN volunteers and um, volunteerism and the global goals. So Aya mentioned earlier about the sustainable development goals. If you don't know about the SDGs yet, I really encourage you to Google what the SDGs are. And this is really the the anchor of our work. Um, so I, I, I'm, in the next slide, I won't really go through all the detail, but I, I, I'm going to share about the 2018 um, state of the world, world volunteerism report. Um, so highlighting that um, volunteerism is both a means and an end of development and volunteerism enables people to participate in their own development, strengthening social cohesion and trust by promoting individual and collective action, leading to sustainable development for people and by people. So volunteers contribute directly to the work of development organizations and towards the achievement of the 2030 agenda, that is the, your sustainable development goals. And um, UNV has a 2016 to 2030 plan of action for integrating volunteering into peace and development. So um, officially UNV is um, administered by the United Nations Development Program and um, so next slide. Uh, this is just a, a quick statistical overview of the global situation of volunteerism. Um, just to let you know that this report shows uh, that the efforts of, uh, of, of volunteers amount to um, 1 billion volunteers around the world. And that's equal to 109 million full-time workers. So there are a lot of volunteers. And even in the Asia Pacific in this region, um, we have 38% formal volunteers, uh, which is myself. Um, but we, surprisingly, we have more informal volunteers. That is like you guys who um, engage in volunteer activities on the side or um, uh, yeah, other things like that. And I want, uh, you can check out the State of the World's Volunteerism Report in our website, that's unv.org. And they highlighted nine um, points on the state of, the, of volunteerism. And I think just to uh, give you a quick um, overview is that um, the report really highlights the ability to self-organize and to form connections with others, especially local, volunteer, local volunteering efforts. And this these efforts are contributing to the diminishing um, risk 
when it comes to when we talk about community resilience and it particularly it's particularly significant for vulnerable and marginalized groups because especially if the initiatives are really from the ground up yeah and so um this next slide is really about what like how unv engages um, volunteers to uh, um, accelerate or contribute to the sustainable development goals. And in, in our system, we um, uh, encourage volunteers to raise awareness, to help us mobilize other people, um, volunteers to deliver technical expertise, um, develop skills like capacity development activities, serve as ambassadors or models in their own right, in their communities, and another way to contribute this um, collecting uh, data. So where can you volunteer, right? Um, how many of you know that we have a Philippine National Volunteer Service Coordinating Agency? So if you don't know yet, please visit their website. It's pnvsca.gov.ph. Uh, it's a coordinating agency. They don't necessarily, I'm not sure if they organize um, volunteer initiatives, but they um, also curate different volunteering initiatives from the um, from um, like nationwide. And if you have your own volunteering initiatives, I suggest that you communicate um, with them. You can email them, message them on Facebook and, and engage um, the, the government right in terms of um, volunteerism. And Jeller earlier shared about um, the initiatives that, that they do at, in schools. So it's really a school-based um, organization that goes beyond the school in terms of um, results and impact. You can work within your community, find um, not just as a civil service organization, right, but also check in with your barangay council, your LGUs, if they have existing um, volunteering activities and yeah. And then at work, if you're working already, check with your company if you have a, say, a corporate social responsibility um, group or initiative, and you can also volunteer um, there or create your own um, colleague uh, group with, um, uh, yeah, with, and, and initiate your own um, volunteering activities. Another one is, again, you can create your own and make sure that you um, partner or leverage on what's already there. The other, and finally, um, I'd like to, of course, uh, introduce the United Nations Volunteers. So please, um, I encourage you to visit uh, unv.org. Um, I mentioned already that, I mentioned earlier already that um, it's, we are administered by the United Nations Development Program. And what it, what it is, is that UN volunteers are uh, providing technical support. Yes, we're volunteers, but it's, it's um, I think there needs to be more appreciation when it comes to uh, volunteers, right? So again, I mentioned going back earlier on the 1 billion um, strong volunteers um, presented in the state of the world's volunteerism report. Um, UNVs, such as myself, are more long-term. We were given monthly living allowance and an entitlement package. It's, it's um, basically just to uh, settle in your duty station. And we, we are usually engaged for a minimum of three months. I've been serving as a UNV for more than a year already. And we are usually hosted by a UN agency. So for my case, I am hosted by the UNDP. And another thing that we, I wanted to share is um, the UN online volunteering platform where you can volunteer to provide online or remote support. It's usually task-based and more short-term. There is no monetary compensation, but you are given a UNB certificate. And um, UNBs are um, validated uh, by the UNB system and, and um, before you get provided with a certificate and make sure that the host organization uh, approves your engagement. And um, some, uh, just a shout out, um, any organization can actually uh, sign up in the platform if you want to engage volunteers. Uh, so what, what, how it goes is you log into the website and then you um, register as an organization and then you can post oppor volunteering opportunities there. But I would suggest um, if you wanna um, also do this, please talk to us. So we also help, um, we can also provide support and it's technical support in terms of um, using the platform, right? 
So for, for UNV, we work under a dual mandate that is to, to uh, mobilize volunteers for the United Nations system. So the UNV serves all the different UN agencies and partner um, institutions. And that, uh, the other mandate is to advocate for the importance of volunteerism and development globally. So um, for now, I think the numbers, uh, there are 8,500 field volunteers as of the moment that's on top of the UN online volunteers. And these are the types of UN online volunteering opportunities that you will find in the platform. It ranges from research to translation to graphic design to community organizing remotely. And please, um, I encourage you to check out that website. And of course, um, this is, I'm so sorry for taking so much time, but this is a, um, uh, this slide highlights our work for um, COVID. So um, UNV released um, a guidance note on engaging volunteers and volunteer groups in health emergencies. So these are just the, some of the areas of work um, where we uh, dip our toes in, um, in terms of uh, responding to COVID-19. And you also find more information in the website. So, yeah. And I'm ending this with a huge, massive, massive, massive thank you to all the volunteers, whether you're a UN volunteer or not, you are appreciate that and be um, grateful for, for all your efforts. And something I'd like to share like a, as a last quote from our executive coordinator, we know that volunteers are always at the front line of the response in times of crisis. And there are millions of people volunteering to keep people safe during this outbreak. So yes, if you need a pat in the back, pat yourself on the back. And again, thank you so much for, for having me, UPLB. Ciao. Thank you, Jo. All right. So thank you very much for sharing that uh, about UNV and also your personal experience as well as a volunteer. So I think we were all inspired by the presentations and thank you for st staying with us. So we have a QA and a portion. So Prof. Mark, do we have still have questions that uh, we need to address? Uh, yes, we do, Mom Jen. So good afternoon to our panelists and live viewers of our webinar. Let us now uh, proceed to our Q&A portion. Should you have any queries for any of all of our participants, kindly utilize the Q&A tab and indicate to whom the questions will be directed. Unfortunately, we do not have enough time to accommodate all questions, but uh, we'll try our best to get back to all of your queries uh, uh, as soon as possible. So let's begin. Okay, for our first question, Okay, sorry. So for our first question, this is addressed for all. Okay, so it says here, I'm sorry. This is from Kirk Taray. Does your organization accept invitations for partnership from other organizations to create, develop, manage programs and sustainable development? Anybody can answer? I think Joe mentioned about UNV, right? Uh, so any others who would like to yeah. share their yeah. volunteer that's, opportunities? Yes, that's right. Hi, um, yeah, for Kirk, yes, we accept invitations and collaborations. Um, it's youth force or email is youthforceph at gmail.com, which I will type in the chat box so you can see it. And on Facebook, you can message us. Um, it's facebook.com forward slash youthforceph. And we'll make sure we actually have a lot of um, projects really thriving on partnerships and collaborations because we don't really, as just said, we don't want to be redundant and we just want to find um, the value that we can add on existing projects also. So yes, please email us and I'll type our email here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Okay. I think I also answered a similar question. So I'm just looking for it and then I'll reiterate what I mentioned, but I definitely said it's possible to coordinate, collaborate, I mean, on different things. There's a lot of, I think the person asked if there's universities. Yes, for sure. We can do so many things. We can do a webinar like this. You can be a partner NGO for reaction. 
there's so many things that we could do together, um, whether that's for the programs we're currently running or programs we could run together. So can't find a question, but my email is patricia at makesense.org. So anytime you want to reach out, or if you personally just want to volunteer for reaction as yourself and not your organization, you can head on to philippines.makesense.org as well and click on reaction. You're going to see it in the front page. So I'll put that in chat box as well. Thanks, Pepper. Okay. Questions? Uh, okay. Some of the questions are being answered already directly by some of our speakers. So that's so right. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm distracted because I'm typing the, some of the answers. Okay, no worries. I think uh, this, this can be a group effort for all of us. So while you're answering questions, I'm also going to throw out particular questions. So this uh, second question that I'm going to throw out is from Charmaine Lopez. It says here, NGOs, CSOs, and POs, and well-off private individuals are, the usual, are usually quick to volunteer. How do we get the vulnerable sector, just like the four Ps, to be engaged in the spirit of volunteerism? considering the SAP management is so ill-managed? And how do we also engage them using the digital platform? Okay. Joe, would you like to... Okay, go ahead, uh, Angelo. Feeling ko po dito na papasok yung groundwork mismo ng paglubog natin sa mga communities okay. na walang access sa internet. Dito na papasok yung pag-house to house natin sa mga bahay. But I know we should do it like cautiously, like we have to protect the tire with mask and mm -hmm. all that, because we're dealing with with a contagious pandemic. But I po dito na dito na ma mahalaga yung parang gra grassroots na pag -se serve natin sa mga tao. Yes, uh, anybody? Pepper, go ahead. Uh, sure, I think that's a good question. I, I can't find it either, but if I remember, it was how can we engage more individuals, especially the yes. at-risk individuals, to this, right? Can't find it anymore. But I would actually say that it. I think um, from my end as a community developer, my experience with volunteers is that you also have to take into account, again, everything has to be design, uh, human-centered design. So it has to really be based off what the people are able to, to give. So it means that if they not a priority to volunteer right now, you need to take that into account because you can't force people na, who are losing jobs to be like, well, volunteer ka na lang in the middle of the pandemic. So it really is um, the capacity and the uh, platform for them to be able to do so. So I would definitely say that you can't force everybody. As much as you want everybody to be involved in volunteerism, the reality is just a lot of people, especially people who, have, who are vulnerable right now, cannot volunteer. And so maybe there is a way to engage them in whatever capacity they can. So for example, like this, webinars. Maybe some people who are here as participants are unable to organize it themselves but are able to attend. So it's just giving them the platform for it to be accessible, but you really can't um, push people even further to, to volunteer if hindi nila kaya. But the best that we can do is to say, kung gusto nyo, and my opportunity kayo, nandito kami, if you want to yes. join us. And you're free to join us. Thank you for that. And that also answers the question, whether you speak Filipino or not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I also speak Misaya. <laughs> oh, very good. Mayong hapon. Okay, how about you, Joe? Go ahead. You were saying going to say something. Uh, Joy, you're unmuted. Uh, you're muted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to re echo on what Pepper said. The reason why it's called volunteerism is because you volunteer, right? But it's really important to distinguish um, like yourself as a volunteer and your beneficiaries. Because um, when you say engaging or making sure that the marginalized or vulnerable sectors benefit, they don't necessarily have to be. Um, volunteers, but they can also be the people that you serve while you're doing your volunteer efforts. And like, like Pepper said, um, when we reflect about our work, it's important that we we um, we give them that space and platform to volunteer. So when when they're really interested and they want to do something about the issues that they care about, they have that 
platform ready and 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 they can participate. Yeah. Thank you, Sir Mark. We have a question from Muchambadum from Indonesia. So maybe we'll take some questions from Indonesia. So. Uh, how does religious-based movement contribute to community resilience amidst pandemic? So in Indonesia, which is a different case in the Philippines, although we have the Mindanao area, it's split. Some hinders the health promotion effectiveness by un underlooking the pandemic spread danger in congregation gatherings. Other volunteers by organizing religious affiliated organizations for food, safety, help communicate good hygiene protocols to avoid the spread of COVID-19. And doing um, first aid, uh, psycho um, I think this is a uh, uh, psychological first aid, yeah, that psychological is. first aid for people in dire health from stress. So, how do we factor in the religious component in volunteerism? All right, anybody? Are there issues in terms of you know engaging other religious sect in your volunteer work? Like yeah. So, yeah. Go ahead, Joe. <laughs> so with UNDP, we work a lot in Bangsamora and Guam. And they're actually even we're very, very proactive when it comes to um, volunteering. And I'm sure um, 2030 Youth Force makes sense. We also mentioned um, that they've engaged volunteers um, in, um, from our brothers and sisters in, um, farm. And it's a tricky, to be honest, a tricky thing to uh, comment on when it comes to uh, religious organizations. But really, I would like to emphasize um, the intent of, of your initiative, whether or not you're a religious org or an org coming from a school or an organization, um, a, a non-government organization or a community-based organization, um, you can still uh, think about the intent and your objectives when you're serving um, your community. So for me, it, like, uh, it, it, it shouldn't really matter if, um, you're a religious org or you're a student um, who wants to make a difference as long as you're um, making that difference, if that makes sense. So, makes sense. Makes <laughs> sense. <laughs> <Love it. laughs> you, you start to notice whenever you're making sentences and then you say the phrase, makes sense, and then you're kind of like, hey, hey, especially <laughs> when you make it makes sense. Um, could I still answer? Is it all right? We have a bit more time. Yes, um, Yes, go ahead. Basically, from my experience, I would echo what Joe mentioned. It's just for us, especially as a regional organization here in Make Sense Asia, I've, I'm handling a lot of volunteers from not just the Philippines, but other countries like Pakistan. We have it in India, there's Make Sense India as well, with very different religious backgrounds and contexts. And the only difference that I would really say here, and it's an important one, but it's not one that really changes the game in, in hugely is the changing of the adapting of the tools and the adapting of the events. That's what I would say is, for example, things such as something we call in Make Sense Philippines as a sense drink. So it's like a inuman where you're, you have an intentional topic on mind, which we, the volunteers here are very happy to organize. Like, oh, let's do a sense drink. It's not necessarily something that they do in the uh, Pakistan community. And so instead of sense drinks, they would just have like afternoon, um, what do you call this afternoon drinks they would rename it the whole program itself would have changed a bit but the context of it uh, the the essence of the event itself stays the same so from my experience that's really how it really changes especially since make sense is non-religious non-political um, and we try to adapt all of our resources and tools to the context you're in but it definitely does not hinder in any way or form your being part of the community and then thinking about context, for example, what if the, even the language or the culture of, of the area of, of your work. Um, so that's a really nice point there. Okay. Maybe one yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you, Joe and Pepper and for your answers. Now, 
for our next question, this is from uh, Dr. Nina Karandang. How do you as assess or how does your organization assess short and long-term impact of volunteerism for different stakeholders? Yeah. So, when, when, it's, it's so hard to separate with UNV and UNDP. Um, but with, with the UNV, um, UN volunteers uh, system, we have our own um, measurement measurements. So what like, the ultimate goal really is, like what um, Aya shared earlier, is the 2030 agenda and the sustainable development goals. And volunteerism is basically a a means to that end, right? And how you contribute to that. So ultimately, the measurement of that really is like going back to the SDGs. And so um, in our strategic plan, for example, um, and in our um, frameworks, we have that uh, reporting um, MNE, monitoring and evaluation mechanism, to be able to measure um, the impact of uh, volunteerism, at least um, from the UND side. So you can, again, you can, visit and indulge in the website if you want to learn more about um, how we are doing that and what types of indicators that we are um, reporting on. So, yeah. yeah um, for the 2030 Youth Force, we actually had job conduct a training for our new leaders on how to properly conduct m and &E. So thank you again, Joe, for that. Um, so what we do is to, like what makes sense, like Pepper said, um, it's a continuous um, iteration also for our, for our programs. Every program, there will be post-assessments also, but ultimately our, our programs are measured or are, we always try to use the lens of the, of the SDGs and the targets. So from framing the projects and the programs to evaluation, we check how we measure against the the target SDGs that we are um, focusing on for a certain project, for a certain program. So it helps that we have an anchor um, when it comes to programs. And also we check volunteer engagement and mem uh, we get feedback from the volunteers and the, and the participants involved. Um, it's an entire, um, there, there's a metric for, for that and there's a forum for that also, but primarily we look at how engaged our partners are and how engaged our member advocates are. And then, of course, there are certain program-specific um, impact that you would like to see. But that's for the long-term one. Um, how much we mobilize our uh, volunteers or member advocates. And if they were able to create their own initiatives for the global goals, because that's what our capacity building efforts are, are for, to capacitate them so that they can also take action for, for the global goals, which is to anchor a framework for sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you, Ia. Yes, Jello, were you going to say something? Same lang din po sa mga nabanggit nila na parang important po yung feedback system from the organizers and to the volunteers, pati sa mga partners. Tsaka yung mismong sa planning ay yung mga sineset yung goals ay dapat based talaga sa needs ng isang community. And kapag na-meet niyo yun, doon po yung parang success rate ng mismong project na ginawa na. Ayun yung sukatan. Thank you, Jello. Thank you, Jello. Yes. All right. Uh, do we still have time, ma'am, for more questions? Uh, one question, then the rest, you could answer it. Uh, okay. We'll just directly answer. Okay. okay. Yes. Especially those that are directed towards the panelists, or specific for the panelists. Okay. Now, here's one question. How do you hurdle volunteer fatigue or community cynicism on one-time events or projects or engagements? If you can share your approach. Okay. Um, it happens a lot, especially in um, communities. Uh, and I think, I think it's really common that a lot of um, organizations now who have grown started from small initiatives in the communities who had 
no idea what they were doing even when they started, but later on scaled up and developed their own systems, like impact measurement and stuff like that. And so it's important when you, like as a, an organization who's um, uh, um, coming from the ground up, right? And starting from the community, as you grow, that you dedicate a time for learning. And I'm saying this as a... Um, uh, parang when I say learning, it's like it can be over dinner or in woman or now virtual. Like you can just discuss among yourselves. Okay, for today, what went right? What went wrong? You ask your beneficiaries and then you communicate that to the public. And in that way, people, your, your target audience, your stakeholders, donors, people will see your results and, your communicate, and, and that you're communicating your wins. And that gives you integrity and um, uh, that I think it's... To me, it, it's really linked to transparency and communication. And, and when you communicate your um, results, uh, I think a lot of volunteers and even donors would be um, more than happy to support you. So yeah, that's a very important aspect when it comes to not just voluntary initiatives, but any project in general, actually. I totally agree with Joe. I would just um, definitely agree with it. I just want to add that Besides the fact that I always communicate human-centered design, meaning everything has to come from the community. Nothing comes from me and as a community developer. I only follow what the people think they need, what they want to build. Is One thing that does come from us internally is the gamification of community engagement, which I always have fun with. And what I mean by that is people need things to motivate them. People need rewards. You know, it's not just volunteering. Although a lot of people, it's just internal motivation where they just want to be like, I just want to help, period. I don't even need to put it on my Facebook or my LinkedIn whatsoever. But as humans and um, just the psychology of things, people want rewards. So gamifying it is actually a very fun way to do it. One concrete example I have is in Make Sense, we have levels of engagement, wherein if you come to one of our webinars, we will welcome you and say, hey, welcome to your first Make Sense webinar. You're now a sense maker. And if you want to organize the next webinar, if you do one webinar or one event, you become an ambassador for Make Sense. If you do more webinars and you're engaged with more programs, you become a super ambassador. If you want to organize other volunteers to become a super mobilizer, which is always just a fun way of how do I go from just a simple attendee to someone who organizes, to someone who continues organizing, to someone who's already uh, coordinating other people even. And because of this gamification where you have levels and there's sort of like a carrot being dangled in front of you and you're kind of like, I really want to catch that dangled carrot with me. You keep engaging yourself and in the in the process of doing that you're also um seeing it within yourself that hey this is actually something i'm having fun with and that i want to continue to do because the community is now a family that you be become part of and makes sense we call it the make sense gang so once you're part of the sense makers team your ambassador you're not part of the gang you don't want to leave the gang because you want to be one of us um, and there's a huge gamification on it. But of course, it's on the back end of things. This is me as a communi community developer thinking of it at the back end. And you guys, I'm just saying, you can be a sense maker, you can be an ambassador, but I'm actually already like trying to reel you in into trying to become super ambassadors yourself. So that's just a fun tip. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Jello? I, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, I, it's just that there's another question also addressed to me, which I would tie to this okay, one. Go ahead. The, the question is from Ivy, I think. She was asking also how to deal with young volunteers overtaxed emotionally or losing interest um, in the costs in general. Um, it, also, it happens, yes. And uh, what we do is we check the costs and we try to address the cause of that fatigue or, or, or why are they losing interest? Because... Um, it may be a personal reason or it may be um, the workload or maybe they've changed their interest. They don't want to do actual groundwork anymore. Maybe they just want to organize online activities of some sort. Or maybe they don't find um, or maybe they have issues with the relationship with relationships with the people they're working with or maybe just time management. So whatever the cause of, of this um, fatigue or maybe losing them losing interest we try to address it at the cost and sometimes we even offer you know breaks because this is a volunteer work 
so they can take a break and they can we can also manage the workload even offload tasks from some volunteers especially when it's needed so there's a always a check-in also and it's important that we keep open communication so that the channels for communication and feedback um, are open especially for organizations with huge memberships or dispersed new members across the country we rely on open communications through our through whatever means possible sir Right. Um, okay. Sa amin naman po, nagkakaroon, nagkakaroon kami ng weekly kumustahan kasi onti lang po yung, we're working with just a few amount of people kasi onti lang yung na, naiwan ng mga estudyante din dito sa UPLB. Kaya ayun po, tas we do educational discussions para mas mapalalim yung understanding namin on why we should continue this volunteer work and we do immersions and a little chat with the community na sineserve na sineserve natin para na motivate tayo eventually kung why we need to push forward with this work. Thank you. Yeah. So I think we need we really need to celebrate, connect, and communicate with yeah. our partners. And That's right. That, yeah. So thank you very much, Sir Mark, for moderating our okay. question. I'll hand it back to you, Ma'am Jen. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. So there's a lot of questions. It's very engaging. Uh, panelists and of course our uh, audience uh, today so we thank you very much we thank you a round of applause to our uh, panelists and of course as uh, pepper said this is the power of community so i'd like to also thank um the um Okay, so our team. So aside from our panelists, of course, Joe from UNDP, Jello from uh, STPV, our TF Cure, Pepper from Make Sense, and of course, Aya from uh, 2030 Youth Force. We'd like to thank the ITC UPLB for hosting us for this uh, webinar, for the first webinar of ST uh, eTalks. Uh, I'd like to thank also our co-coordinators, Prof. Francis Mark uh, Felizar, our chair, uh, chairperson, Prof. Clarice Pulumbarit, Prof. Gillian Consignado is joining us as a participant as well, and also Prof. Uh, Ron J. Dangkalan. We'd also like to thank King uh, Manzano for helping us with the PubMats, and also thank you to the participants who uh, gratefully uh, uh, joined us, even if we've extended the time uh, as much as we'd like to chat more. I think we have more opportunities. Don't forget, we will issue an e-certificate. We'll send you the email, especially if you've registered. Um, we'll send you an email for the evaluation form and for the e-certificates. And, uh, and with the permission of all the panelists, we'll share also the PowerPoints to our uh, participants, if that's okay. Yeah, and uh, there's a link there, the email. So Pepper, Ea, Jello, and Joe will gladly answer your questions and even the department as well. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, we hope to see you. As we said, this is a series. So we have the next webinar on June 18. Uh, it's uh, 1400, 1530 Philippine Standard Time. It talks about data. So why data matters, the role of geospatial data science technologies, for social service delivery in the global pandemics. We have three speakers from DSWD, from UP Resilience Institute, and another one from a local um, organization that works on GIS. So with that, thank you very much. A round of applause, everybody. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And have a great day. Mabuhay po kayo lahat. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Ay, <laughs> okay. Are they gone? <laughs> Naka-live pa ba tayo? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>